Okay, welcome to episode three. I, I think it's episode three. It is three. Oh, wow. Episode three of the Tap Haven podcast. I'm your host, Eric, joined by Anthony and Nat. Anthony. <laughs> uh, how are y'all? Is Anthony going to go first or is it going to be me? Oh, no. So how are y'all no. doing this week? good we're all right uh well i'm all right long week as per usual but oh, yeah last the weekend dude i feel you i feel you long weeks Sat in the dmv for two hours and uh was told to go home Oof. oh sick Oof, i've been there i think i told I, I told anthony this story but i uh they had just changed my dmv's site to this new site uh, and I think this was like height of COVID and mm-hmm. I go to the DMV and I wait in line for four hours just to get to the front of the line for them to ask me, do you have an appointment? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Before this week, there were no there appointments the for the DMV. The yeah. last time I went to the DMV and this was the second time I had to go, I was getting a new car at this point in time between the span of two weeks from my first visit to this DMV to my second DMV, they switched everything and now you needed an appointment. You were a baby last time. Now oh, they're, man. Now they're hitting you with adulthood. I know. You I need to have an appointment, dude. And it's so like they, they sent the me doctor. home. Yeah, and so they sent me home. I waited in line for like four hours. It was ridiculous. Hate it. That's, that's terrible. A, that's a 16th of you. No, not, not a 16th. Oh my God. Are you about to say that, a 16th of my life? No, it's an eighth of your day. <laughs> it, was, it was. It was. Man. So we, Waking day. Yeah. So we Sunday. we actually have a fun little uh a fun little treat. Um and I don't know whether we should say the name or not until they start like sponsoring us, you know. Like maybe maybe we just we probably keep it. Should. I mean we've kind of already talked about them in the previous po- oh, uh, podcast. Yeah. That's true. So unless you plan on sc- scraping through the previous podcast and bleeping out their name as yeah. we say it. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we we ended up we wanted to try out some of the more interesting obscure whiskeys that we definitely haven't tried before from Flaviar. And so we got one of their packages. This one kind of centers around the American Rockies. So these are uh, the next three episodes. We'll actually cover three different distilleries that are all in, I believe, I believe they're all in Colorado. I have to double check that. Pretty sure it's all Colorado. Yeah. But um, they are. Uh all in that area, all in the Rocky Mountains. So this is a pretty I- interesting change of pace from something like the Kentucky bourbons or the Tennessee whiskeys of the world. Um, and then we also got for our bottle uh, a nice little no, treat no, too no, 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 that we'll no, no. that we won't we won't di- yeah we won't <laughs> divulge that this episode. But you know, uh, check three episodes or so you'll get to Gotta you'll get to see what that is. Eric, you gotta keep them coming back. I know, I know. We gotta, we gotta keep them guessing. Keep them, keep them in the, keep them in the dark a little bit. You know. So, when our, do we get to pour this? Are, are we gonna talk about this first, or are we gonna? Like, oh no, we can, we can go ahead and pour our little, little vi- tasting vial that we have. Not gonna lie, this looks like a, like a little flask of poison or it something like that. Really does. Now these. <laughs> These are 1.7 ounces, and I'm I'm just gonna go out and say it, Flaviar. Please just use use a round number. Like, what are we doing? No, no, <laughs> liters. No. The more liquid that they can give me, the better. Wait, are you are you advocating for them to give us more? Are you yeah, them give to us round up? give us a two ounce pour. You know, and like, are we doing a? Yeah, we are doing a. Yeah, they Bruh. they they number them <laughs> as samples. You know what? I'm just gonna full pour it. There we go. That's what I did, man. I just full poured it. Full poured it all in there. Now, what am I going to put in this glass afterwards? Like, I could never get rid of this. <laughs> Fingernails? Ew! Oh, no. <laughs> Fingernails! Jesus Christ. He definitely got food brain. Oh, man. 
Oh, Anthony. I know. We, we, so you'll have to excuse the, our robotic co-host today at some points in time. Hopefully it's uh, replaced by AI. It's yeah, truly unfortunate. Yeah. We, a Anthony isn't actually a, a real co-host. We, we're testing out our new AI algorithm. Damn. Damn. Me, me and Eric are both, uh, what is it? Silicon F uh, Valley Trust Fund babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is our first project. Oh, man. <laughs> So this this whiskey is actually by a company, Tenth Mountain Whiskey and Spirit. So mm -hmm. they're they're based in Colorado, I do know, and their whole thing is all about the. Uh, there there was this Tenth Battalion, uh, essentially, and so this was back in the the Second World War. Like the Tenth Battalion was sent over seas to Italy where they would battle the German army for a long period of time. And they, they did a lot of cool stuff. Definitely worth a read. There, there's a whole story on their site about this stuff, which I, I recommend going and doing. But this, uh, this whole company is kind of advocating for that, uh, that type of lifestyle. I think they even talk about it. Their, their, their whole thing is the mountain lifestyle. And wow. yeah, they're trying to bring together the old with the new and all of that kind of stuff. And they, they talk about that a lot in their, their website. Now well, we we're supposed to blind taste this. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to give information to the people. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think okay. blind no. tasting it is in, uh, you know, what okay, we good. should do now however if you as a customer go into flaviar i definitely recommend doing blind tastings i think they offer a lot of value for new drinkers especially um now this whiskey is actually it's actually got a nice color it's a little bit light it's not very viscous um this doesn't have what what is it called feet or whatever yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a this is not a viscous whiskey um, now, it, the mash bill on this is actually 75% corn, 20% American rye, and 5% malted barley, which, malted oddly barley. enough, okay. is very similar, not quite the same, but similar to the mash bill of the Maker's Mark, except it's not using the, um, the, the red corn. Yeah, right. I'm getting a, I'm getting a lot of. Or the red right winter now. wheat. It doesn't yeah. have the red winter wheat in it. Sorry. So instead of the red winter wheat, you're replacing that mash like that with American rye. So this gotcha. might be a little bit spicier in comparison. I was about to say this does not smell spicy. Well, so funnily enough, Flaviar gives you all these tasting notes, and they actually say that this one is like you should be smelling a lot of sweetness. So I. Yeah. I get that. And I, I get a lot of that corn on the nose. Definitely Absolutely. a lot of yeah. corn. A lot Me of corn. too. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet AI. No one tells you to speak. <laughs> and I, I definitely get a lot of that corn. Now, as far as honey and vanilla, I'm not getting a lot of vanilla. I'm not getting a lot of wood. There's like a hint of oak in there, but not much. for me wow now that first sip i just get corn corn it's literally corn with yeah. a little bit of pepper that rye spice to it mm -hmm. and that it, 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 that's definitely forward you get corn that, sweetness with rye yeah the mouthfeel is oh, we, we lost anthony altogether we lost anthony oh no he's gone disconnected from the call audience he may or may not return. We'll see. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I get a lot of that corn sweetness with Absolutely. a little bit of rye. I'm not getting any spice. You weren't getting like any that, of that I, rye spiciness? Okay, so, clarification. I'm getting spice. I'm not getting enough for me to say that it's a significant uh, decider of how I'm experiencing the whiskey, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I'm not... So, I, initially on on chewing it it's very the mouth feels very light it doesn't yeah. stay very long on the tongue i could see that uh, and it's almost it's almost like it's not there it's like I'm, it's almost 
what is it? Now, I I it's will almost like it evaporates off of me off of you. And I I I I think Flavior has kind of got got that on the nose. They do say that this is a softer, yeah, flavor palette. I I definitely mm. think it has that. I would yeah, say just, this is. There is nothing unpleasant about this whiskey if you like rye in general. I think there is, the rye part of it definitely sticks out to me. But the corn sweetness comes through a lot. This is a very approachable, sweet, nice and easy whiskey to drink. Hmm. I will say... This is the most mild of the rise that I have had. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was it. Um, on on the second sip, you do get that kind of black pepper spice. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to catch the sweet, other than on the nose. Really, I I get a lot of the corn sweetness right up front. I feel oh, like no, it I mean, like the corn. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, what is it? What else do they have on this little card here? They're saying that there's oak, vanilla, and then honey. I'm not getting a, a lot of honey. I think I, mean, I get the honey on the afterburn. So, like, yeah. the, the burn that lingers on the tongue has, like, a a bitter honey flavor to it. Mm. Almost for me. Now, What are you catching on the nose as you're drinking this? On the nose? Mr. Super knows. Yeah, I've I I really this is one where in my opinion the corn that sweet corn almost like yeah. fructose syrup I'm back. Smell. He's there back. He Our is. AI is back. Uh, uh, what what are I get what the corn on the nose? Okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, autonomous neural trained holistic organic network yeet is back yes AKA we rebooted him <laughs> a-n-t-h-o-n-y hit us with the acronym. notes there anthony hit us with the notes <laughs> definitely corny the right Very. sweet is pretty good after the first sip could get the oak the oak smell was good definitely soft <laughs> very lingering I agree. Oh god. <laughs> I definitely enjoy this one. Oh, you do? God. Okay. Come so back. so Come you're back. You, are you putting this higher than the maker's mark that is deproofed? No. Oh god, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, let, uh, let's go. So Nat, Nat, what would you what would you rate this? Out of 10. What are we, what are we giving this? Honestly, this is like a two or a three for me. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I do not like so. We'll put we'll put two point five. I'd give it a two point five. Um, I will say that the mouthfeel doesn't do anything for me because it doesn't really give me a any form of like stimuli at the very end of drinking it. It's like it's there and then it evaporates as soon as I open my oh. mouth. Um, I kind of want the rye to stick longer than just the spice that kind of sits at the back of your, of your uh, tongue. Um, in terms of um, actual flavor, I feel like it is pretty one dimensional. Uh, you drink it at the very beginning and it's the same taste that you get at the very end of that trail of, of uh, flavors. And as I've said before, in the last in the previous two podcasts i really need the whiskey to hit me with some uh variety i need some form of uh yeah i need a minutia of, of flavors i need you to be able to hit me with something other than just corn or just uh pepper autonomous right. neural train holistic organic network ye agrees two out of oh, ten God. <laughs> two out of ten two out it's of like ten like a white dog with food coloring oh <laughs> man mash. wow oh man <laughs> no but but so anthony you're you also agree not 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 high on your list in comparison to the maker's oh, mark i like the smell oh, okay he likes the you smell. like the okay. smell that's it <laughs> okay 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 yeah i can I th uh eric 
Ooh, bated breath. <laughs> you can feel the podcast holding its. I know. Its breath. I know. I was. I was leaving everybody on the edge with. <laughs> um. I there. Okay. So, I'll I'll give my rating in a second. I I, I want to talk about the own the the biggest upside to this whiskey. Okay. Which I don't want to be hindered by any number that I would put to it. Because I do think that this is a very approachable whiskey. Yes. And I, agree. I I think Noob's whiskey can concur. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. And for continue. Yeah, yes. <laughs> continue, continue, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> but uh we're gonna, we're gonna have to reboot him again, Matt. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. He's gonna, the sass uh, out there. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> we uh, told the freaking kids and the, and the yeah. script kiddies to fix that. I don't know. I, why, I don't know what they're doing. It, but... We don't pay them enough, I guess. But I mean, we don't pay them at all. That's the whole trick of it. <laughs> anyway, continue. Continue. So, so there, there is that like one huge upside. Like if you are generally just getting into whiskeys. And um, you like approachable whiskeys. You want something that's smooth, something that doesn't linger. You just like getting your feet wet kind of in mm -hmm. the whiskey world. This mm. actually, I think, is a super, super approachable whiskey. I would say so, yeah. And I think if somebody gave you a tasting of this for your, you yeah, know, within your first 15 sips or drinks right mm -hmm. you're going to be in a real uh easy going space to enjoy this whiskey and kind of have fun with it. with that said mm -hmm. i heavily agree i i yeah i want more complexity i want more flavor profiles um i get a little bit of the oak the more I, it kind of lingers I definitely on the nose, especially if you kind of do the the hand test. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you kind of put your hand over it mm -hmm. and then you let it hit your hand. Mm -hmm. And so you get some of that whiskey and you kind of just rub it on your hands a bit. The acetone, the, the alcohol will actually evaporate and you'll get more of the, the, the uh, esters. Aromatics. Yeah. Right. And when I do that, I start to get more of the nutty smells that they, they, they describe, right? And I get some more of the, like, wood coming out. And it tends, it works out pretty well. <laughs> However, I would want that more on the palate, which I definitely don't get enough of. Absolutely not. Uh, I will say something. I don't know if, you, if you're finished, but I do want to go ahead and add something real quick before you give your full rating. Yeah, I see this as almost like being Jim Breen watered down. Okay, okay, I could see that. I could yeah. see that. Now, let me let me ask you a general question: How much, yes. if somebody were to offer get, offer you a bottle of this, and they say, mm -hmm. "Pay what you want for this," how much would you pay? Maybe twenty bucks. Twenty five. I'm looking at the price online. It's not fair. <laughs> oh, you're cheating. You're, you're cheating. Bunch of cheaters. Bunch of cheaters. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I buy it on sale for $48. No, it's not. I, I, on so sale. MSRP on this is 60 bucks. And, at, <laughs> and at the $60 price range, I, I just could not mm -mm. pay $60 for this. At the sixty dollar price range, I mean, not. we're Absolutely looking there. Uh, like, I think you can get wild turkey, like rare breed, for close to that price. We can get, we can you start can looking. Maker's Mark for sixty. You can yeah, get a Maker's Mark spell, but, special edition but, for that. But well. even even before then, we're looking. I I think you could you can get a Russell's Reserve ten year for nah. 30, 38 bucks, which is one I don't think Nat has had, but we'll definitely try on this that. this podcast it is a great whiskey and for 40 bucks i think it's really hard to beat that price but yeah. we're we're talking if you can find eagle rare you're getting a 10-year bourbon for 45 dollars mm. if you can find it in a store near you you know True. if you're Ooh. you're you can find a buffalo trace which is a like for 20 bucks 24 dollars 
is fantastic. And if you can find a store select of Buffalo Trace, oftentimes they go for less than 40, right? And so when you're, you're, when you're starting to look in this market and you're starting out at 60 bucks, which I, I don't mind if they start out that good at, at that price, but you really have to come swinging. And this one, like Nat and Anthony kind of said, they have, uh, you're getting so much of the corn and rye, and that's all you're getting. It's all you're getting. No. It's a white dog. Yeah. And With so color, we don't. It's really not a white dog, honestly. Like the white dog that we had uh, at, yeah. uh, at your bachelor party is white dog. Yeah. This this is I would, something I would, that I would not be surprised is mixed with a whiskey drink at a cheap club. Agree. Well, the thing is, is you're not making money if you're putting a sixty dollar whiskey in a. No, obviously drink, not. But so. I'm, I'm talking in terms of like flavor. Like the flavor oh, yeah. itself is something that I would probably now, catch. Let me let me say one other one other pro to this. Okay. This could be a great sweetener or an infinity bottle. Which I don't know if Nat or Anthony know about infinity uh, bottles. So uh, in infinity bottles are this concept. Thanos comes for you. What was that? If you make one, Thanos will come for you. Yeah, just sometimes. Shut <laughs> just, just shut. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, God. before we go to the infinity bottle real quick, yeah, 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 the only thing I could see them marking the price up for is it actually does linger for a very long time in the mouthfeel. Whatever mouthfeel so that it does give you. If you're a mouthfeel person, maybe that's why you would get it. I feel like this is not, uh, not viscous enough for me for mouthfeel. <laughs> I definitely like something closer to like a stag junior or a um, like a barrel, but I you definitely get a little bit of that marbled rye bready notes Absolutely. that linger for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Typical of a rye. Now, I I will say, mm. uh, well, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Let me let me get back to my tasting review. Give so, us our tasting review. An infinity bottle is where you buy a decanter and you add consistently to it. So you put in a whiskey you don't like, add blend in some other whiskeys, put in some whiskeys you do like, put in the last like four or five ounces of a whiskey before it goes bad because it's oxidizing because there's too much you know space in the bottle, and you keep making. Uh, an infinity bottle that you keep drinking from. See, I feel like you call it infinity so you don't have to call it what it actually is. It's a suicide uh, uh, drink uh, that you put a bunch, of, a bunch of sodas in one cup and that's but, basically what it is. But like, you just, can do just, your just, own just blend. Just call it an amalgamation. Just call it, an amal just call it a monstrosity. It's fine. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> they call it an infinity bottle and okay. what I will say is if you have an infinity bottle and it is a little hot and needs something to sweeten it up. This may be your stuff. Like, this would do that. It, kind of how the Bardstown uses the Ontario whiskey that's 90% corn, mm -hmm. right? Super sweet whiskey. They put 10%, 20% into their blended whiskeys to add a little bit of sweetness. So, with all that said, there are some heavy pros to this. But I tend no, to agree. No. I'm 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 putting this on the lower end of the spectrum, and I think if it is not undrinkable, no, so the it's not undrinkable. the way sure. I kind of do my rating system is five is your average whiskey, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think anything below a two is kind of undrinkable. Okay, I'm thinking that three or four, it's drinkable. But it has some heavy cons to it. And I don't know if I quite put it below a three. So I, I'm, I'm saying three out of ten for me is about okay. where I'd put it. It is, okay. it is a drinkable, approachable whiskey that it has, has some, some serious flaws that keep it from being a whiskey that I'll go to often, which would be mm -hmm. like a five or a six. This would be the first and last time that I that I would try it. If I was looking for a experience, yeah. I would. If it was cheaper and uh, I 
and was looking to try and make drinks for a party, I would totally make this for like a whiskey sour or something like that. But oh, yeah. I, I love rice for that. Sazerac? Yeah. This would probably make a, be a great one. A yeah. great Sazerac. I, I just yeah. wouldn't do it for $60. Like, no. It's not going to no. beat a Rittenhouse 101, you know, a lot of, which is 20 bucks. Of, you know? There's a lot of marketable uh, whiskeys that are out right now that would definitely beat that out. So I so am I, we, I'm happy to be done with it. This is again, this is no mark up against the people who made this. This is more so just talking about our own personal tastes about the hundred percent. So if somebody finds something lovely about this, by all means, enjoy it. Continue to, but for us, uh, for us, it seems it's going to be a bit of a no. Yeah, I I would say this is on the lower end of my list. Now I I will say I would love to see um so mm. they a tenth tenth mountain has a bunch of different options i would love to see something from them that's got a little bit more age yeah because this is one year right so this is their um their bourbon Okay, so it has to be four. It, well, no, 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 no. So a uh, Kentucky straight bourbon oh, okay. has Sorry, a minimum yeah. four. This okay. one has the, the minimum age inside of this bottle is two years. Uh, we don't know if they've blended anything with this, mm -hmm. right? And we don't know if they've done anything else, right, or added any other thing. But... We know that it is a bourbon, therefore it is aged at least two years in New American White Oak. Um, Fantastic. So, I think um, it might be so expensive because of where it's produced physically. Could be. In the Rockies, in Colorado, that's a very expensive place. Uh, they don't necessarily have uh, cheap real estate and stuff. I can see that. And I, I could actually see... I think that this bourbon with a little bit more age underneath it has a lot of potential. I tend to find that it's in, yeah. high corn percentage bourbons mm -hmm. do better with age in the barrel because that like sweetness the dies down. Mm -hmm. You get more of the wood and oak flavors, which tends to bring out more complex you know, profile. Mm -hmm. You would get a little bit more of the wood, obviously. Yeah. Um, I would say that it would really come down to how they're firing the staves. Um, Cause I know but, that for, for us, we want a more, well, for me and you, Eric, we want a more intense uh, flavor pr uh, platform. I don't know for Anthony, but I would probably be looking for something that's probably pretty well charred in terms of the stays to be able to go ahead and get a little bit more smokiness to that. Cause I think if you put like a little bit of smoky in like a deeper and darker flavor palette to that, then you're talking, then you're talking more my language. Yeah. Obviously not and asphalt because we've had that before, but. <laughs> yeah. And that will happen a little bit with age in the barrel too. Like you'll just get more of the, um, that those flavors from the charred oak, the longer it's in there. And if we're talking a two-year bourbon, that's not a long time for in a barrel. No, no. Matt, not. you wish it was smoky? I wish it was smoky, yeah. Bro, I got a new segment for us. What's that? One of these days, we all have to get some of those smoker things where you just put it on top of the glass. I, I have uh, one. I'm good to go. I'm ready. Whatever. And then <laughs> if that happens, if that happens, you just plop it on top. You're like, it's, I got to smoke this one. I can't drink it how it is. Oh, uh, wow. This you smoke it right on the podcast. Fair. Yeah, this could you know? do a little with a little bit of that. Actually, I think that that, that would wouldn't be, be so cool. Yeah, that wouldn't be bad. Now, I I do have a kind of on the same lines of a new segment. So we have some pretty big uh, bourbon news this week that I'm really excited for. Oh, so Angels Envy mm. is releasing <laughs> a cask strength rye. Oh, yes. Now yes. I, 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 so, so what some of you may not know is that um, 
I'm a huge fan of Angel's Envy. I love Angel's Envy. Now, I don't know. I, we're going to have to look into this. Um, mostly because these things are hard to find. A lot of Angel's Envy's cast strength stuff tends to be very expensive very quickly. Um, our AI is glitching out. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, Holy moly. Yeah. But, so they just released that the this is a, a thing this week. Um, Sick. Or this past week. So, that may be something that we're able to get our hands on and do a little tasting of, which would be really exciting. Uh, a cast strength angels envy rye, rye would, be would be insane phenomenal yeah so what do we have right now and uh eric so uh for anybody who's listening right now so we had a whiskey slash bourbon awakening um uh, about a few months ago at eric's bachelor party and that's the reason why we're kind of doing this anyway but uh at the very end of it we went to angels envy and we got a bottle of um bourbon that i don't even think comes on the floor for sale and it's fantastic obviously but i'm wondering where on the flavor palette that even is because i didn't even know if it was a rye i didn't i, didn't, I honestly so, don't care it's so, just fantastic yeah it is fantastic so to give some people and this will be a long time coming it is mm -hmm. a very special bottle to us and i think our current plan is that we might do a tasting of it on episode 100 or something like that yeah, so so yeah. like if we make it that far that that may be a fun thing or to try episode we all went full time <laughs> <laughs> i don't know so the thing is it also comes down to whether or not we will actually be able to keep enough of it until episode 100 because i don't know about y'all but my dad came over and found out that you've I had already TV. opened it Yes. Oh my <laughs> God. Mine is unopened and will Real continue cold. to be so. Well, so, shit. <laughs> so, now, either way, if Nat runs out of his shit, we'll, we'll, we'll get no, him, we'll, we'll drive to him, slap him a few times, and then give him <laughs> a tasting bottle of some of ours. But just leave me on the floor like Yamcha, just like yeah. my arm twisted and everything. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So, Angel's Envy has a special uh, experience that you can do if you go visit the distillery, and this this is a very unique experience in that the bourbon that you can get out of this, which the one we have is a single barrel bourbon. Fantastic. Now, but there are some special things about this bourbon that you can't actually guarantee or get from getting one off the shelf. Yeah. Even if you get a select barrel, it isn't quite the same. And the reason that is, is because if you do their tasting, their bottling experience, you get a single barrel, but it is a single barrel out of the honey well. And the honey well is a place in the distillery the master distiller has marked off as being the creme de la creme oh, of the distillery. Oh, but there okay. is there is one other thing. So the, not only is this barrel or set of barrels or area in the distillery marked as the master distiller's favorite place in the distillery that produces the best whiskey, this particular barrel is guaranteed to be the first time that barrel has been used for bourbon after the um the rum casks so uh, so angels envy and their bourbons right are rum cask based aren't they yeah and so uh is it is it rum cask uh, i know they they have the rum cask but now i'm um, unsure unsure <laughs> port cask it's ruby port cask okay there we go yeah yeah so this is actually the first time, the, the, the barrel that we got, that was the first time it was used after the ruby port was aged in it. They so use... It's going to be... Yes. And uh, so they, use, they will reuse the barrel that we had four or five more times 
but it will never be the same as what we just But it got. will never be the same as the first time that it was used. Now, you can luck into you getting a bottle of that was that was the first time it was used. It but it's unknown and you can't figure it out without backtracing or knowing somebody who works at Angels Envy and figuring out what barrel it came from and actually knowing whether or not that was the case. Makes sense. Makes sense. We were guaranteed to have that be the case. So we know that our barrel was from the Honeywell and it was the first time it was aged, uh, that bourbon was aged in it after the Ruby port was aged in it. I don't know what we need to do to save up to make sure that we do that every like two years, but just, just let me know because I don't think I can live w without this stuff anymore. I don't, you guys haven't tasted it yet. So like we, we really, all tasted it at the distillery. We all got to taste the barrel recent for me, baby. It's yeah, more that's true. That's true. You've had it recently. That shit is I, amazing. I, I look at that bottle every day. Ah, that bottle's oh, the bottle's. I look and, at it and I'm like, yeah. "You're a bad girl." I realized. Uh, I I don't think Matt was on the call a few weeks ago when Eric and I were like, "Oh yeah, we're not gonna open that until like the hundredth episode." Oh damn! I'm so sorry. <laughs> we this didn't, man. We didn't think to say anything, so it's our fault. I feel bad. Yeah. Oh, we man, didn't I say anything. I, I wish I had known. It's okay. I'll, <laughs> you know what? I will take the bottle out from the public area and put it somewhere safe and secret. Nice. I will nice. treat it like one ring now, at this point because it is temptation. It's so good. Oh my god, guys! Um, nice. Now so I will say <laughs> this: this this Angel's Envy <laughs> Cast Strength Rye probably cost a um a pretty penny. I think they. <laughs> I think that it'll pro I think MSRP for it is about 280. Yeah, that's about right. Um, but I I am excited to see if I can try to get us a bottle and then definitely we'll do a tasting if uh, if I'm able to get a bottle. Fantastic. I but love it. Exciting news in the bourbon in or the the whiskey industry gotcha. that I that I wanted to share for this week. Where we have something to look on the for. edge of our seats because honestly yeah. angels envy is quickly becoming my favorite i mean it's a little bit easier just because their branding is pretty on point as well uh, i don't feel like i'm Great really branding. gravitating towards any other uh distilleries other than new riff but that's more so because they kind of like they popped my cherry they were your for first all, love for all, yeah. for all they were your first purposes. love <laughs> and we'll definitely have to go to the new riff distillery for I don't know if they're gonna have it again, y'all. Like I've looked everywhere for this bottle. We're gonna is... we're gonna go to the distillery. We'll with the, it, like it, they have a selection the experience. There's no way that it's we can go the same. select our own bottle from New Riff. Oh God. Okay. Okay. No. Um. So with that with that said, what have y'all been playing this week? On, oh, what's man. on the radar? What's, what's, Are we what's, on the game section already? Okay. We're, we're on the gaming section, you okay, know? What okay. have what have you been up to? I I can go first if you want to, Anthony. If, if you want to go. I was going to say it looks like my internet might be working right now, so it could uh Yeah, you could. Let's go. Take yeah, go moment. take it take advantage yeah, yeah, yeah. of it. Go. go, 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 go just go, go, go. in case I'm yeah. watching the the network uh, graph right now. <laughs> Constantly. Yeah, <laughs> going up and down. <laughs> The stress. So I've actually played many more games than last time. Oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, okay. I'm excited. So I probably play a little bit of Trackmania. Y'all know how it is, but not. Oh, of course. Of enough. course. Of course. An addict so, has to addict. I mean, it's <laughs> fine. We're with uh, you. Most interesting. Also, of course, I play some Sea of Thieves. I've been mm -hmm, mm -hmm. game trying it. Um, I started playing Slay the Spire again. Awesome oh, game, yeah. Great on game. the iPad, uh, it was really satisfying oh. to now, go um, and just Have they updated that it. at all? They they do like the daily runs and stuff at the least. Um, I don't really know. They have to be doing I'm, something unless I haven't fully played it. Oh, okay. I still have things to do. Oh. Um, so I've been enjoying that on the iPad since I think I think I got it because my wife got like a trial for the arcade thing it was on there, there you go. yeah nice. if you buy a new phone then you get access to the arcade for like three months I've been yeah. sitting on mine for like forever I'm not I like I don't play games on my phone so I'm always like what the hell am I gonna do with this but yeah yeah but yeah and then the last game that I've been playing is Hogwarts Legacy which I might have mentioned that last Ooh. time but it's that time of year 
is that time of year. My wife and I had a uh, Hogwarts date last night, which we will finish tomorrow because we both fell asleep during the first Hog uh, Harry Potter movie. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, sorry, we had a Harry Potter date. I said Hogwarts. Um, Harry Potter. Uh, we made... We have the unofficial Harry Potter cookbook, so we made uh, some some pies, whatever they're called. There's like an assortment of pies, uh -huh. and uh, we made some uh, pumpkin pasties. Ooh. I mean pasties. Pasties Buddy. is a very different thing. But um, I mean, he was riding high Eric, last night. Eric, you know. don't, don't Eric, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had a good night last night. Oh, oh my God. God. You got to do what you got to do. You just gotta do what you gotta do, boy. <laughs> Before I forget, though, uh, I don't know if y'all have played Hogwarts Legacy yet, but I have a rule when playing that game that I recommend people follow, and the rule Go. is never fast travel. Because oh. that game is similar to a Bethesda game in a way. It's definitely not the same, but similar in, it, in the way that we were talking on the last episode about how... It's all about feeling like you're there. Mm. And if you're fast traveling all over the place. You're kind of like power gaming, gaming like it there. to a degree. Yeah. yeah. It's not the same mouthfeel as what you're saying. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I've actually been playing another game. Ooh. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, yeah. I can't talk about it. What? Because I'm under NDA. Okay. What? Wow. Indeed. So all I can say is it's good, and I can't wait. And I hope we all can play it together soon. What? Okay, I'm in. Yeah. What do you mean you? Hold on. I'm gonna. Be... I can't I'm say be... anything. I'll get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You can't say anything. I don't know whether this episode will release before the NDA. Drops. What do you mean? Good. Is it's it so a tr fun. like? Is, wait. Hold on. Hold you on. can't Let kiss me... and tell, Matt. Oh, God damn it! You can't tell me anything, can you? No, I can't tell you. Can't tell you anything. Uh... Not on this podcast. What really makes me sad is that none of you, that neither of you are playing it because y'all would be like, "Oh, I know what you're playing." Yeah. Oh God, I can't even guess because you can't even confirm. I hate this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oof. Do you know what you might be able to do? What was that? You could text somebody that I. N Never mind. Can't. Can't do anything. Can't, can't do, do anything. anything. Can't do anything. God, I didn't say anything. <sighs> no. Nope. Okay. But yeah, okay. Uh, and I think we actually forgot to do this segment last time, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The things I'm looking forward to yeah, are uh, Sea of Thieves is coming out with guilds, uh, <laughs> rowboats that you can save to your ship, and Safer Seas, which is like uh, the training grounds for people like my mom who can go and play and do story stuff with me without getting killed. It's like single player mode almost. Not oh, single nice. player, but single ship mode. It's PvE mode. But you don't make oh, much money. Gotcha. It's, it, it's safer seas. Lower risk, uh, lower reward. I can live with that. Yeah. And then the other thing I'm looking forward to is uh, the NDA game. I can imagine. Yeah. I, can imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. That's so sick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, Eric, would you like to go or should I go? You go for it, man. You go. Okay. Okay. So, um,. I've actually haven't played anything, but oh. I have, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I am planning on playing Raven's Watch. Raven's Watch is made by the same people who said who made Crypt of the uh, the Cursed God or Dead God. Um, mm. It was a dungeon crawler uh, roguelike, uh, yeah, roguelike that came out about five or six years ago. I would say. Aesthetically, very pretty game. Um, and they came out with another game, which is this game called Raven's Watch. It is based on uh, old fairy tales, but on a darker twist cl closer to the Brothers Grimm. So you have, um, uh, what's his name? Who's uh, Siegfried. You have the Ice Queen. You have Geppetto, the Puppet Master. You have Little Red Riding Hood or just Scarlet. Um, and you have Aladdin. So it's like, it's a fair amount of just kind of like weird um, context as well as like a general like vibe. 
Um, the goal is to make it through three nights and then kill the boss that appears on the third night. And that moves you to the next area, which is then the same formula of three nights. And each one is different. Like you can go for different power ups. Everything shows up differently. And it's really entertaining. Like I watched somebody play uh-huh. it uh, about it's probably six, seven months ago. And I was like, man, I should really play this game because it kind of reminds me of Hades. But yeah. I never picked it up just because I had things to do, one, and then two. It's still in early access, so they only had the first level in there. Um, it has co-op. Yeah, it has co-op as well. Um, it is entertaining to watch as well as to play, so I can get why they went for the, the uh, multiplayer aspect to it. Uh, I just wish that the game came a little bit more baked on the initial launch because there was so much good groundswell going with this game until people started playing it and then they freaking dogged it into the ground because oh it's not long enough don't even release your game and allow people to pay for it if you don't even have a like a nearly half finished game and i was like it's called early access for a reason like I get that you're salty and you want people to be able to release a game and not have live service. Like we're not looking for live development. We're looking for live service, but with a game like this, it's so similar to those kind of indie projects that created the whole huge groundswell that is now super giant that yeah. you could definitely see this as being like the first steps towards a, uh, an IP as well as a development team that specializes in delivering products with that level of detail. So all that said, Arabia's Watch is going to be up on a list of games to play. Uh, I've been busy as of late, doing a whole lot of work and studying. So this is going to be my little relief that I get to play after I'm done with my units for the week. Excited about it. Nice. And that's what I got. <clears throat> oh, oh, what am I excited for? So I'm excited for y'all to fucking watch Castlevania Nocturne because it's so good. Uh-huh. I, I, okay, so I, I actually tangent. almost started walk, watching that the other day. Mild tangent. You start watching it and you're like, dude, where's the sauce? And then like the last two, three episodes hit and you're like, there's the sauce. It's, oh, uh-huh. it's nice. so good. The people, uh, I love the slow burn that eventually like snatches your fucking soul out of your body, especially whenever you get invested in a character that you're already like, I kind of don't like you in the first place. And then they start, then they have the redemption arc and you're like, Oh, this guy's dope as fuck. What do you mean? (laughs) This is the time he deserves this. He deserves this. And then there's a twist at the end that literally i don't you guys probably maybe maybe not have watched the first uh iterations of of castlevania but there is there's enough of a kind of cult following behind this show that i know for a fact if i put a single frame of this last episode on twitter or anything like that i'd get lambasted because people are like this is this is one of the best twists that we've seen for like an an American styled anime animation show since oh. Avatar. Wow, it's fantastic! Wow, pretty high An- praise too. Animation <clears throat> is on point, y'all. It is better, so better than Arcane. Uh, yes, yes. Really, better I than would, Cyberpunk. I would, I would say it is better in the sense that for the genre of animation that it is, it has no reason going as hard as it does. Mm. Like it go like as soon as action starts happening and like high octane, like I'm not saying like little like baby fights or whatever, because the choreography across the entire show is fantastic. Like, I don't know the names of the animators off the top of my head. I will have to know after this, uh, after this podcast, so I can bring them to the forefront because you guys are wonderful. If you're listening to this, I love you. Um, <laughs> But they serve so much anime inspired uh, ass kicking, but with a dosage of kind of the flavor of Castlevania, which is dark and kind of uh, macabre, 
there is no moment where you're like, damn, that looked like it was like he took the hit like it was nothing. Like every single hit looks like it kind of fucking hurts. Like, oh, so good. So good. Anyway, uh, okay. I'm done gushing about Castlevania Nocturne. You guys need to watch it because then we can go ahead and talk about it. But <clears> I don't know if you guys have watched the first season of Castlevania. Sorry, the first uh, the Castlevania series. If you haven't watched that, if you're listening to this and you haven't watched it yet, please watch it. It is gas. It is so good. Uh, anyway, that's what I'm excited for. Wait, excited uh, to actually start talking about this show because I need people to be able to be as excited as I am about this. I'll watch it. Yeah. And real quick, you reminded me of another thing I'm looking forward to, which is not anytime soon, but Cyberpunk 2.0 came out. Oh. And so I, one uh, of these I'll... days, I'll pick that up maybe next year and try to get into that. I don't yep. have a machine to play it, unfortunately. PlayStation Ooh. 5. Is it on PS5? Yeah, it's on PS5. Yeah, and oh, it's okay, got like the yeah. feedback stuff. Yep. Oh, hell yeah. The haptics? Nice. Yeah. Well, I think so. Yeah, and uh, apparently they're coming out with a live action series too. I oh, don't okay. want to watch that. I don't. Oh, yeah. I don't. I want to watch more of their animated series for sure. For sure. Please that give me incredible. another one. Yeah. I don't, yeah. It doesn't even have to be about the same characters. I would, would I would love to just watch another show so, hey, in Night hey. City. One Piece live action has been great. Oh, I've heard great things. I keep on Wait, that have you have you not watched I it keep yet? Putting it off. I I I know it's good. It's, it's a very good animated but very not good. animated segment. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh very it's very faithful, very worth watching and i think it's going to bring so many people to the anime because the anime uh, like for anybody out there who's seen it like the, the, the anime is better full yes. stop mm-hmm. but i love how they've adapted it to live action and they've been so sure. faithful to the series and if you like the series if you like the live action you are only going to love the anime mm-hmm I'm just scared to pick it up, guys. I don't you know, know what it just is. Dive, dive in, man. Their casting was phenomenal. They, like, they do such a good job. The things that aren't in the anime are, are, aren't in the live action. It's very reasonable that they're not in. And yeah. the biggest change that they made was introducing some characters in the series earlier to connect everything a little bit more cleanly for a Hollywood audience. Makes but sense. in doing so, they didn't really do anything bad, and the characters that were introduced early were faithful representations of those characters. Of the actual character, yeah. And so, and it is something that those characters would have done. So, like, yeah. they really did a very faithful job just reinterpreting it. Very well done. Yeah. Very worth watching. Um, I've heard I've heard great things. Nobody on the internet has told me that like it's not something you should watch. Oh yeah, I think I think it's just like one of those situations where I know I'm going to need to be in a specific place to be able to binge it ah, from beginning reasonable. to end. And I haven't had a lot of schedule for that. Uh, That's lately. reasonable. So yeah, it's Got definitely it. worth say. binging. I've only watched two episodes, and both of them have been really good for. One and Dunn's. Mm-hmm. Like, one and you Dunn's could totally good. binge it, of course, but so it's well, the felt continuity of that, One Piece is really kick off until later. Well, not even that. Mm. Not, they, uh, currently, they keep it really contained to island, island, island. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So they don't really cut, like stretch it across multiple episodes. Like, they, yeah. The series got it. Now, okay. They like, do a, a little bit later, but it, it's still that same idea. It's like for major fights like Mihawk and like finding Sanji on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the first two episodes, the cliffhangers aren't going to kill you. Okay. Yeah. What well, does, it end? does it end? At, does it end at Fishman Island? Sorry, not Fishman Island. Arlong, Arlong Park. Park. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Completely blank. Let, let me skip, what, 2,000, uh, 2000. like 2,000 <laughs> chapters or whatever the fuck it is? How many chapters? Where, where is Fishman? I know it's Fishman. It's Fishman Island is episode six hundred or something like that, it has right? To be. It has to be. Right. Oh god, the the One Piece freaking fandom is like, what a fucking chump. <laughs> yeah, right. A ch- oh. Let me let me skip six hundred and fifty three chapters. Is it six hundred fifty three? 
So the Fishman Island starts at 6.03. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's fair. Okay, so like... sub, sub 600, but yeah, I'm still way off. I got you. Yeah, no, not even, not even, not even time skip yet. Not even time skip. Not Sorry, time. spoilers, time skip. I don't think anybody's watching. Yeah, it's, like, a, well, it's a, a spoiler. Yeah. What do you mean? It's a, sh- <laughs> it's a shonen, ju- it's a shonen jump yeah. publication. Yeah. Every shonen yeah. jump publication does a time skip. Time skip. Did Black Clover have a time? You know what? We're off topic. <laughs> yeah, we are off topic. We are. Off topic. <laughs> and Anthony, Eric. Oh, sorry, Eric. It's your turn. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Good. this this past week or so, Project Corm started. So I have uh-huh. been leveling up a shaman in a, a, an EverQuest server that's in Classic Era, mm-hmm. and man, it's been amazing. It's been so much fun. Um, there are so many people online. Everybody's leveling up together, and it's just got that like MMO camaraderie feel to it that's really charming. And at some point, the player base will drop off, and it'll be a little less charming, I'm sure, but. At least right now, it is a blast. Um, gotcha. And the, the developers are really good about going in because that whole client is open source and they're doing a great job of like going in and fixing quality of life, client interaction issues, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So, you really uh, well done. You're, you remind me of a really cool thing going on right now for hardcore for classic wow but you have to have a mod called like last words and you'll be going all around the world and there will be like a death marker and you'll see the last words of the person that died there and it'll just be the last oh, thing they said oh, that's, cool. that's kind of like cool. yeah one time it was uh i you'll be fine just go around i i have <laughs> been binging I mean, that guy died and <laughs> i have been bitching binging the highlights of <laughs> the hardcore deaths which is whew, and that's real, real it's funny. it's rough to watch but it's it's f- fun to watch them uh and i have been tempted at some point in time but i think the only problem that i have is that i've already done the wow hardcore when it didn't have all the quality yeah, of life yeah, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. i've leveled multiple classes to 60 without dying and while it is nice and i think people who haven't done that should totally enjoy classic hardcore i think it's a wonderful thing that they put into the game i i personally don't need to do it again and how cool would it be if an mmo came out that was only hardcore or if diablo for instance 4 came out and it was only hardcore and i think it would not get the it wouldn't go well it, would, it wouldn't go well it wouldn't no. uh, okay it, here's the thing the, only hardcore for three months i mean so the hardcore topic is interesting because on one hand there are a select subset of people where hardcore is wonderful and it, it from a from that perspective they're like that's the game i'm looking for right mm-hmm. but they are in a super minority mm-hmm. in the sense that the people that if you want to make money off of a game you cannot make it hardcore in that sense. There's not enough people to go ahead and shell out money for your multi-million dollar uh, game at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. You have totally to have totally some great. sort of casual. And let me, let me give an awesome example of that because uh, this game is really interesting. But you have... Um, uh, wow, I'm blanking on the name of it at the moment. Albion Online. Uh, I'll be online. Not, <laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. I'll be on online. It, when it started out, it was this Kickstarter idea where they were like, "We want to make a hardcore MMO. So when you die, you lose all your stuff, and we're gonna make it so crafting and all that kind of stuff. You have to craft and get all that gear again. And if you die, you have to get it all again. And when they first started out, that was the ob- the, the, the the sandbox thing that they were looking for. Every single update that I have seen that has been a big update for that game has added solo player casual experiences and making more approachable experiences to try and increase their player base because 
the people that are playing that game that are actually shilling out money and like doing things and active in that game aren't they do not play that game for the hardcore experience and the groups and guilds and people that do love that game for its hardcore experiences and that is cool but that is not the majority of the players of that game and nor will it ever will be facts facts and if you want to make money and this is purely if you want to make money like if you're making a passion project or if you're a, a development company that already has a game that's making a lot of money and you want to make a hardcore game for a select group of whales who pay a lot of money to like enjoy this experience and you want to make a good experience in that regard all power to you that game's going to do amazing for that unique that subset audience mm-hmm. but it's not never going to make a lot of money for a lot of people like it's never going to be a huge audience game it would be really cool if developers of games like Diablo 4, World of Warcraft, El- even Elder Scrolls, or not, not Elder Scrolls, oh my god. Bethesda. You just said it. You just said it, the game that you're playing. Um, oh, EverQuest. 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 Yeah. If they had, you know, they have a, a hardcore mode, but make it very compelling to try it. To give I more would... people that experience. The, the reason why that would probably work out if they put in the development time and also thought about the actual rewards that would go into it like i know that for me i played destiny and destiny 2 uh almost religiously for a very long time and the payouts were those moments where you were participating in an event and you got a huge payout from it either in game or out of game so Whenever the sleeper simulant dropped and everybody was participating on how to even get access to it, what what did we have to do inside the room to go ahead and even get access to the quest? That was an an entire community event that rallied around a singular uh, point. And then the end result was a super powerful item for anybody who participated in the entire race. Because once you participated, chances are you were keyed in and you knew exactly what you needed to do in the raid. So that's in-game, and that requires a game studio to commit to putting something so vaunted and or valuable that it becomes a status symbol. Yeah, I think another yeah. way to put it, though, is it's really, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. I think Anthony's totally on point with like the payoff for these things needs to be satisfying and rewarding. Mm-hmm. I well, think imagine if you imagine if you were playing World of Warcraft in hardcore mode and that was the only way to get like the best awesome leg- actually legendary item for your guy. And maybe there's multiple that you can get, but it's only at max level. And then if you do die, you get to keep it. You get to keep the character. They become a normal character. They can never unlock any more of the awesome stuff. And, you know, for the next expansion, you'd have to start all over. Or for the next thing that you didn't get, you'd have to start all over. But you got something really cool and you got to bring it into the normal realm. And Path, Path of Exile does, does that. Two games. Well, I don't think so. Because Path of Exile does exactly what Anthony's talking about. The Path of Exile yeah. has a hardcore mode where you can do hardcore only stuff. And the minute you die, you get pushed back into the normal mode. Normal pool. You don't yeah. lose everything. And that is, that is cool. I'm not, I'm not saying that isn't a bad idea. And Path of Exile does really good. But I think still Path of Exile has this problem of that can't be the only experience. And the experience that they are driving or or developing has to be catered to the casual audience first. And I think that's where all my problems with hardcore games kind of lie at the the massively multiplayer or the AAA or AA studio level is that they cannot cater to the hardcore audience and still make a game that looks good for their board of directors or the people that are uh, like in charge of the money at their company. Because so I disagree in the sense that 
I think that they can't develop a game like that with the money that they would usually attribute to a game. Like if you are saying that you want to create a game that is more more attractive to the every man who plays a video game, like they just come back from from work, they play for two hours and then they're done for like pretty much the rest of the week. Yes, you can go ahead and design that, but there there comes a time where you have to look at the amount of investiture you're willing to put into a game to develop not just the every man's uh, game, but be able to add an aspect to the game that is truly for a hardcore aspect. I don't think anybody is developing that hardcore of a game across the board, like well, anywhere across the board. I mean, I I think it's as simple as looking as like classic hardcore, like. Blizzard, a huge, massive company, designed a game that really doesn't work well in hardcore mode. Like, the game wasn't designed with that intent. Mm -hmm. And they have this they challenge mode. <laughs> yeah, they designed this challenge mode and created, made a game out of it. But they didn't actually do design for a hardcore mode. They just kind of turned it on and added some quality of life features. I'm all right. for that. I think that's awesome. But like that game is designed to die. For the, yeah, yeah. And, and so what I'm tr what I'm trying to add to that is that there needs to be another layer on top of that to create that uh, actual hardcore aspect to the game. Like you being in a hardcore game should increase one the stakes, but also the rewards. Like there should be a completely different echelon of the game that you gain access to because you've made it that far without dying Agreed. and it should continue to ramp i i think a good a good way to uh, one of the games that has done it the best and the longest i don't quite agree with the the payoff they kind of took an easy way out but i eve online Eve Online. Ah, uh, yeah. Let me, yeah. let me, let me, let me yeah. just they, they, explain no, it. I agree. The, I agree. I agree. Go ahead. Yeah. The, 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 the things that you do in that game equate to money output. Yes. Actual money output. Actual money output. Yeah. And therefore, playing that game and the risks in that game have a monetary real life implications. Stakes. Yeah. And stakes. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. That means the risk reward on that is outside of the game world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're investing time for real money. You know Essentially, what I just realized? you know, what I just realized what solo leveling the story is literally how you would handle a hardcore gaming st story. Yes, there are people who are in the game who who play and they play normally, but at a certain point in time you are different like you literally could like walk into a raid by yourself uh, not even actually that's not even a fair estimation because raids themselves would not fit within maybe the paradigm of this game but you would be able to walk into situations where it would require hundreds of people to go ahead and rally together and you'd be like yeah it's just a tuesday like that would, don't don't of, go. Yeah. that would be the level. Yeah, that would be the level of hardcore that I would assume I, would make a would actually make me, a hardcore game. Let me let me tell you what my my thing is. Okay, you have a hardcore MMO. Let's let's stick to MMOs. I I think if we're just looking at single player experiences, I think there are a lot of games that do the risk reward on like dying and living pretty well. Mm -hmm. I, and as, as I think we're really narrowing down to this, like I'm playing with groups of people hardcore. Correct. Correct. And let me let me tell you a hardcore experience that I think is worth, like where hardcore should live. You have an MMO, and everybody wants to get to this in game where you have raids. Mm -hmm. There's a a raid throughout this raid. There are checkpoint bosses. And if your group is not geared enough, right? So if they're going in fresh, they don't have any of the gear for this raid, mm -hmm. right? It is balanced such that it is intended for parts of your group to die throughout that raid. Correct. So that to complete this raid, your guild has to go in with the intent of there are going to be sacrifices 
weeding out the weak. Not weeding out the weak. The but the, but, the, but the, <laughs> the sacrifices have to be made. And so now you have to, if you want to get through the entirety of this raid, some person, it's balanced such that 10% of your people die by the end of the raid or something like that. Like they're going to have oh, to tweak these about, numbers. You're not talking about like a single fight. You're talking about across the entire raid. Somebody I'm talking about die, across okay. the raid. Yeah. Okay. You have to make people sacrifices. Mm. And the leveling experience and the experience that you have to go to is this troublesome thing. And these raids aren't designed with this chance of dropping stuff. It's because, not based on skill. It's because it's on, not. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. I don't want it to be a, 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 like casino. I don't want it to be like loot pinatas. What I, what I would say is this raid has six bosses. Each one drops this first one drops this weapon and this piece of armor, right? Every time you kill it. But to kill the first boss, one of your healers has to go and sacrifice themselves at the 25% health point into this machine to bring down its shields. <laughs> That's fucked. Yeah. Right? Okay. So yeah. now you have to yeah, give up. Stakes. <laughs> you have to give up all of the time investiture for that person in the guild just to beat the boss. So wait, so is that your, is, I'm, I'm, this is my I'm way. This is your way of saying like th that would be an actual hardcore game or is this like hardcore? So let me, let me think about, think about it as like classic hardcore, right? Okay. So like you have, wow, if you have a guild that can go in and knows all the raids and does all and knows all the mechanics, Mm -hmm. You can one shot a raid in classic easily. All of those raids are simple. They're not mm -hmm. difficult. If you have a group of people that have played WoW Classic or any of those raids before and knows any all of the mechanics or just you give them a booklet and test them on it, which I've seen people do, mm -hmm. like if you can pass the test of like here are the mechanics for the bosses, you're done. You don't need mm. the gear, at least not for the first one, until you get to, you know, next remus. And then you have a gear check, right? You have mm. some gear checks, but those are those are statistical numbers. You can track everybody in the guild, and once everybody's above that number, you're done. You have solved it, right? True. True. And the execution of that feels like stat like moving around it's spreadsheets statistics. to me it's yeah. all statistics yeah and there uh, there are some mechanics that are kind of like uh, whatever timing and i'm don't, not saying walker, the yeah. execution of them is still fun i'm not saying that but what i am saying is that that makes for a non-hardcore experience because the like at that point it is a solved game mm -hmm. but if you have an mmo where sacrifices have to be made for this in-game content changes everything, right? It make it. I, I okay. I can see what you're what you're aiming at for that hardcore aspect, and I I agree that adds a flavor of no loose ends and sorry, not no, not no loose ends, but uh, no light decisions. Yes, no, no that's kind of what I'm getting period. at. Like the decisions you make in this MMO matter in getting yeah. that. Like, for example, like Anthony was saying, there's this amazing weapon. It drops off the, the final boss, right? Mm -hmm. If you, five people if you want to get to that weapon, five people have to sacrifice their time for you. And when you yeah. get it, when you get it, <laughs> when you get that weapon, you're like, you will never. In, here's the coolest part about that. I guarantee you, if there's a tank weapon that drops off that final boss, Pickle Juice gets there. Don't start with you. Me. Don't you say that. are Don't never, you, say that. you are never going to forget the five people who died <sighs> for that weapon. You are never going to forget. And that's such a cool thing. You will remember that till the day you die. You I will, will be never like forget King's Defender. Right. I will never forget right? King's Defender. But think yeah. about if it took five people deleting their character to get King's Defender. You would remember their names, every single one of them, and how they died forever. That's true. That is cool as shit. And no game 
has that type of feeling with it in a hardcore sense. I think so. To add to that, I think that is an element of hardcore, correct? But I also think that because hardcore runs a gamut of variation across multiple game types, you will, if, if we are if we are still talking about MMOs, let's go ahead and take uh, Anthony's uh, same idea. That could be one way to go ahead and approach it, and and there could be others there is room there is room for excellence there is room for people to say i'm not going to sacrifice anybody and we are still going to make it through this fight i don't know how but we're going to do it agreed agreed that would be cool all i'm getting at is that and you probably the designers would probably need to make it where you don't know ahead of time you don't choose ahead of time who's being sacrificed you just exactly exactly. everyone just knows few of us aren't going to make it yeah you know what so you know what this is and i i, I might i might be running into like a, a can of worms on this one but i really do think this is one this is a case for people saying that an ai generated mmo that uh reacts in real time to the reactions of the world and develops things in a um in a deviating path is the the answer to having a game that is fully immersive and also friendly to not just hardcore players but also uh uh normies like i I can see a game that's basically like hey you want if you want renown you can get renown you want to go ahead and raise an entire city to a ground to the ground and see what happens afterwards by all means do so but also know that every single step that you take is going to cause a ripple that then affects the rest of the, the rest of the game itself. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's a lot of promise in generative models or yeah. decisions that you make in the game affecting the game and everybody else still being able to make cool decisions as well that also affect the game. AI is going to be a, a great tool for thing. that. Oh, shit. So, sorry. Um, Literally, I said Ripple, and then it just com- completely clicks on with me. I've been listening to an audiobook that literally c- tackles this entire concept. It's called The Ripple System. The series is called The Ripple System, and it's based on a character, a uh, person who goes into a VR-based, uh, fully gen- iterative, uh, AI-developed uh, game. Well, AI-developed, but like it's AI um, re- referring back to humans to go ahead and give it, give them the context and create the framework around it. But oh. um, it's literally designed in the sense that like whatever you do causes a ripple within the world and changes it for everybody in it yeah, that's and cool. they and they can either react to it or they can go ahead and start creating their own ripples and then it becomes like a question of whether or not your renown or the way that you live within the game is something that you want to change the world or do you want to live as a as somebody who reacts to it and i <sighs> I know we've been discussing this for a while. I don't know if that's an attractive game to me. I don't know if I would be able to go ahead and play that game and enjoy it. Because I, I, I for, it, for instance, favorite game in the last, God, honestly, in the last three years, God of War 2. I was able to pick it up, put it down, have an amazing experience, feel badass, get the story fin- uh, finality of, of, of a narrative that played all the way from beginning to end and then put it down. I, and that's just the kind of player that I am. I understand that that's, that's me. So I think, I, I, and I think this is true for everybody uh, to some degree. I think you can experience nine out of 10 experiences for a game with very little stake. Yeah. I think there are a lot of games where you can pick it up and it's amazing. Like nine out of 10, everything's wonderful. Mechanics are great. It's just a wonderful game. And I mm-hmm. think there are so many games like that that you can experience that are nine out of 10. However, every single long term, or not long term, every single moment in gaming where I was like, these are the moments that I remember or will remember for the entirety of my life. And one of two things in common, 
something that was super, super social based where mm-hmm. the group or people that I was with made it impactful or two, the stakes were so high and the reward was so good that it meant something. Fair. And those yeah. are the top experiences that I had. Those are my 10 out of 10 experiences. And I think that's true for everybody. Now, I think there's valid, a valid argument of whether the time investiture for each individual person is good enough to like have, like have them invest that time and experience that 10 out of 10 experience. Like there are other things you can do in life that also do that same feeling, right? And those are the type that don't have the investiture requirement that gaming does to have those experiences, right? So is it valid to say, oh, let me invest a thousand hours and a ton of people's time to get this 10 out of 10 experience? Or do I invest two hours, play something like Hades and have a nine out of 10 experience or 9.5 out of 10 experience and have even more time to have more experiences outside of gaming? Yeah. You know? Yeah. What were you going to say, just, Anthony? You just made me realize that two of my favorite games for the past year or two have been hardcore light games, and that's Star Citizen and Sea of Thieves. In Sea of Thieves, everything you do for that session, if you don't sell it, it could all be gone. You can lose all of your progress in an instant. In Star Citizen, if you store your stuff, you can keep it, but if you take anything with you or you gain anything while you're out and about, if you crash, if someone kills you, if someone pirates you, it's gone. It's all gone. And, yeah. and that brings a level of intensity and sacri- it, it, it's so good. And you know what it's other two only. experience types exist in both of those games? It is core mm. to their gameplay. Social interaction. Yeah. yeah. The game yeah. world, it, it, its enjoyment is almost, for those two games, I think Star Citizen in the future, this will change. But I think right now, at least, Star Citizen and Sea of Thieves both require that social social interaction and social Mm -hmm. experience to be impactful. If you just go and do the questing and get off and you don't encounter any other people, you get nothing. That game doesn't give you the same type of feeling, right? Very boring. Unless you're a very niche player. You know, then there's always going to be some, but I mean, even, like, even then, like, it's a like game if, if, if uh, uh, but even then, even then, if you like Sea of Thieves, and I'm not bashing you in, in, in this regard, if you use Sea of Thieves, I am. Uh, mm, if you use Sea of Thieves <laughs> as a game to like, I'm done with work and I just want to sail on a ship and do a quest, right? And I don't want to encounter any people. Do safer seas in December when it comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you do that, I am not bashing that as a thing that you should do because that can be enjoyable. But what I yeah. am saying is that it, it really can't be the 10 out of 10 experience because it doesn't meet the requirements for being something that you'll remember for the rest of your life. You simply will not remember doing your little gold uh, you know, quest or treasure but chest quest. Someone comes out of nowhere because they were hiding on your boat the whole time, and then they try to steal it, and you beat them, and you keep it. Now suddenly, that was amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, story, it's it's having it's either having stories against uh, including people or having stories with people. I get. Yeah. 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 And so that's what I'd say. And now here's the other uh, the thing I would say to your your point, Matt. I don't think any company has truly created the prime example of an experience that we're talking about, where it is no, an, absolutely not. A, a, a multiplayer socioeconomic game that has lots of good and well-implemented mechanics that also has this sense of risk-reward that has great, both great payoffs and high risks great risk. that also yeah. seems impactful in such a way that it can actually create. (laughs) 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 You're right in the corner. (laughs) Uh, 
<laughs> God's cracking up. I love you. Enter stage left, Anthony's wonderful <laughs> wife. <laughs> she uh, delivered me more drink. <laughs> nice. That's fantastic. True fantastic. keeper right there. But uh, <laughs> man, that was funny. But yeah, I don't think anybody's capitalized on a no. game that can create those experiences reliably yeah. through it the mechanics, just the mechanics that it has mm -hmm. implemented. Right. Do you think it's po do you think it's possible with the current tools that we have now? My my initial answer is no because hmm. of the amount of development time and effort that it takes to create assets and stories because I mean oh, like I don't know I, if anybody's really like looked into what it takes to actually create a story that me, people enjoy. That's me, that's just hard. <laughs> uh, let me let me tell you. I I think it's 100% possible. Here's the problem. The companies that could do this on a reasonable time scale, because I, I think Anthony would also make the argument that at some point, this is kind of the goal of something like Star Citizen. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Star Citizen has a shit ton of money. And I don't see them completing in the next, I mean, even the guy, the, 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 the CEO himself said that they don't see a production ready, you know, release until like 15 years, I think, was his timeline or something like that. Like 10 to 15 years. From now? From now, right? And this is, this is the company that has like some of the most money in the world, right? Now, if you were to tone down a lot of the graphics and stuff like that, I think you could lower this number. But in a reasonable time scale, I think there are companies that could currently do this in the game development space. The problem is... The game we're talking about won't make money. I agree. I, I promise you. I, I promise agree. you. Do you Absolutely. know where is most of the market right now? Mobile games. Mobile games with microtransactions. Yeah. Like 60 to 70% of the, the market. Like it's yeah. insane. Right. And those are people who aren't even a lot of those, a lot of that group doesn't overlap with like PC games. They True. just they just don't. Then yeah. you have a portion of the console gaming market, which, mm -hmm. by the way, doesn't often overlap with the PC gaming market. Mm -hmm. Now you have the PC gaming market. Most of the people who play hardcore games play it PC, on the PC, PC market. Games. Yeah, I, I mean, this is just the reality of that situation. And, and like, yeah. I'm not saying there aren't console gamers who wouldn't love to get in dip their feet into these experiences and i'm not even saying that there are people in the mobile that wouldn't want to dip their feet into these experiences what i am saying is we are getting a sliver of a sliver of the market mm -hmm. that would actually go out and say i want to pay for this now how do i as a company that could realistically create this massive undertaking of a game create enough money to maintain how can i convince it? investors and boards and yeah. people above me that this is the game we should focus on rather than saying oh let's create an mmorpg that is very casual and has all these things and if people create their own hardcore experiences we can release a classic hardcore mode just like blizzard has done that is just the <sighs> game with death turned off that's what I'm saying. I am saying that while yeah, this experience yeah. would be great and the people that enjoy that and are looking for that would love to have it, mm -hmm. there is no money in this market because nobody has done it yet. Now, here's the thing. Somebody goes and they do this market really well. The first person who does it will create a game that is super memorable and changes the gaming market forever. But nobody's Correct. gonna. In, no, nobody wants to be the first person to invest in that idea. I was gonna say that you really have to be the only. You have to be the pioneer, and you have to be willing to be able to get crucified for the fact that you are the first of many yeah. Yeah. to go ahead and create something like this. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And that's the that's the hardest part about that. Now that harkens to this idea that you know roguelike games and roguelike games are really getting more popular. And we're seeing single-player experiences kind of dip their toes into these types of experiences. 
mm-hmm. but they're missing that social interaction level. Some of them have it a little bit, like Dark Souls having the blood stain, multiplayer. People love that. Mm-hmm. The PvP experiences. Like they're starting to dip their toes into this idea. Ooh. I definitely think this is going to happen. It's just we're I think we're still so 15ish years early. Yeah. One of the things that looking at only the data and I linked a graph in case y'all wanted to see. I saw. When you're it's only funny. looking at the revenue by platform. Yes, mobile games takes the lead. It's almost it's over double it's by PC more games. than triple. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost double console games in revenue. But another statistic that is very important is player retention. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. To a new IP. Yeah. So if you want to be around for a long time, if player retention is greater on PC games, like it you create a hard, more hardcore following, almost like trying to create a you know, people have read Harry Potter books and they did, they're fans for life. Yeah. Type sure. of thing. Yeah. Um, Will that happen on a mobile game? I don't think so. I don't think Will so. Will it happen on a no. console game? It definitely can. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen Will it. Will happen on a PC yeah. game? It definitely can. Yeah. And I, I agree and with that. That's probably why entirely. they do console and PC together. If you add those two up, is it better than mobile? Uh, it's close. It's close. I think, uh, yeah. 51 plus Very 38. Close. Yeah. You're short, uh, you're short like 2 billion. Yeah. Yeah. You're short like 2 billion. So That's combined, they're almost equal. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, is good for us because, as we've seen, consoles are basically PCs. They're getting closer and closer now. Yeah. yeah. It's possible. For sure. That, possible. that gap is definitely uh, lessening. And again, I, like I said, I think the market is moving towards being in a prime position to, to do this, establish this type of game. I think there are mm. companies that can execute on this style of game and have the money to do so, albeit not in quite the insane way that Star Citizen is. Right, Star mm-hmm. Citizen is, I think, being really overzealous in like trying to attain this experience. But think about a company that tries to create a uh, a more simplistic art style, like a RuneScape or a Albion Online, that tries to do this type of experience better. Right, mm-hmm. like they're they're going to be in a prime position to be able to create this type of experience. In a True. much faster timeline than Star Citizen could, yeah. because Star Citizen is spending a bulk of its time and resources on 3D modeling, graphics, and design, and all those kinds of things, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. It's but it's in a realm of its own in how much time it will take. Oh, Anthony is bit crushed out of his fucking mind. He did. He did. That's going to be the um the thumbnail for this video. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Ready? make a funny I'm face. Ready. it's so fucking terrifying yeah okay then uh, to kind of cap this off because i do want to go ahead and give us like a little bit of something that we can uh put a positive spin on this um what game style would you want to see incorporate this kind of model where it's completely iterative and the story the story is you and the people within the game uh creating something together because I mean, like for me, I know what mine is because uh, I honestly look at the storytelling that happens within D and D, and I think that plays a large part in what I want to see in a game like this. In the sense that I want to see people's actions over a wide swath swath of time, making uh, huge variations of change within plot and focus. Yeah, I. I would love to see this style um, and this this type of game be similarly done to something like... Elden Ring? No. I, w- I would actually... I'm looking at this from like a technical perspective and what I'd like to see right now. Okay. And what would offer fun interactions while also being able to be dynamic in this type of way in a realistic time frame. And the way I see that is through voxel or Terraria style engines. Yeah, and it's fair. It's not as attractive, but it's fair. It's not as attractive, but 
we already know how popular these two styles of games can be. Terraria is a constant top seller. It's massive. And yeah. it's huge. And Minecraft is one of the biggest games on the entirety of the planet. And uh, like people already have shown that they love these games regardless mm -hmm. of the graphic style and the simplicity of the interaction with the world and the ability to interact with the world is super, super high. Mm -hmm. which means it oh, is entirely else, yeah. exactly it is entirely realistic that somebody could create this type of interaction with that style of game true especially true. considering this more ai generated procedural like realistic procedural generation it's, it's that can occur friendly with that kind of game style anyway yeah yeah think so, about an mmo in a terraria art style where there are different worlds or different planes of existence that has this type of D D. it is also a little bit more hardcore it ha it has so much potential mm -hmm. in that regard and they already do yeah. this style of game with terraria already as it is with things like mods and so mm -hmm. to say that this is a possibility, like it is a hundred percent a possibility. Huge. Cause what, I, so I love this aspect of it. Cause then I could go ahead and go full fantasy mode. My initial reaction is like, yeah, you have the Terraria, Terraria aspect where you have uh, a world that pretty much everybody inhabits and it's massive. Like you can go ahead and scale those things to become absolutely ginormous. And I'm sure Huge. it wouldn't take much to go ahead and increase, increase that size tenfold. Huge. Yeah. But what I'm thinking is like, you have an entire universe pretty much irritably generated and people choose which planets to be on. And yeah nations within those planets either a lie or or go to war you have entire planets that are having completely different stories and different yeah. pathways and eventually at a certain point in time you do have those interactions where people are going mm -hmm. to places that weren't even in you couldn't choose to inhabit them they're like they're off in the ether and they weren't something that you could select beforehand the the idea like food that that gives me is like super exciting and I, yeah. I like i would love to see something along the lines of like just people having a space opera of a, of a time you know yeah like i sorry, mean not even a space like, not even a space opera like literally like just like a full-on life within a game that is played almost in parallel to not just how you play the game but how others react to their playing of the game and your playing of the game outside of the game like the, the yeah. meta discussions that would happen because of that kind of game would be very interesting in the sense they'd be like what's happening on omicron 6 and people who are on that planet are all like weathered everybody's at a bar nobody's talking <laughs> because, yeah. because something terrible has happened and everybody's fucking like over it yeah and they already um, did stuff like that with i mean a good entrance while not as well executed as mm -hmm. it could have been but i mean starbound was yeah. like uh, it was like a beta yeah. essentially of this idea right mm -hmm. the only thing that those those developers haven't done simply due to time constraints and money and all of that kind of thing is get the massive multiplayer social mm -hmm. interaction with it Right. Yeah. That's the only thing that they haven't done. And that's that's purely a money and time problem that they that they didn't want to experience. Now Terraria is obviously a little overbloated. Mechanics are kind of simple now. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. there's so much stuff, right? Like I would have loved instead of a bunch of expansions to Terraria, I would have loved to have Terraria 2 or whatever it is. It kind of yeah. it, it, it kind of addresses some of these issues. But Anthony, you back. Yes. Doesn't look like it. Oh, no. no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, he can hear, though. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Eric. Go ahead. No, no, no. no. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that is the, the style, like, the game style mm -hmm. that I'd, I'd want to see. Not mm -hmm. because it's what I'd ideally love to see. It's not, like, my, my dream game, obviously. I would definitely love it more if it followed something more like Elden Ring or something like that. 100%. Yeah, exactly. 100%. But, more story, like, up front, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, rather than having to read it. I mean, I would yeah. love to go ahead and read it as well as to, like, yeah. get into it. Because then you're like, oh, I'm a scholar pretty much of 
this game yeah but like but i i less but again so i think that game. elden ring style or like an mmo rpg style that that is more like world of warcraft or something like that that kind of goes into this 3d but also i want to have these types of experiences mm -hmm. again i think we're too early in the market i i i see those needing see to be done by triple a yeah. high cost developers where we're talking i think we're 10 to 15 years out from seeing that yeah. idea start to be a thing in the market yeah you would have to yeah, at minimum totally agree yeah. i think i think the the first hurdle that they have to that they're gonna probably tackle is scale because you do have to take a multi-massive a multi-massive player sorry massive massively multiplayer, multiplayer massively multiplayer aspect game and scale it up so high yeah. that people can play it as if it's single player because there's literally nobody else around you like you are Lit, you are exiling yourself into solitude because of the game being so big. Yeah. Like, I think, obviously, uh, No Man's Sky kind of gave us hope in that aspect, especially with their their the size of the galaxy that they they generated. But I, at this point, I have a feeling to be able to hit this level of intricacy but also as well as a uh, variety they're going yeah. to, have to they're going to, have to stretch uh, that and free. and i do i do love kind of what you get in no man's sky but i i do have to like say a no man's sky is a single player experience it is a single player experience yeah that's and it's designed with player. that intent it, uh, like yeah. uh, not even that uh, like i any multiplayer aspect they put into that game that game was designed up to this point to be a single player. player experience yeah therefore yeah. it can never satisfy to its full extent all of these things that i'm talking about where there's this mm -hmm. social risk reward combo that creates these 10 out of 10 experiences there like there the game has to be designed and this is part of the problem like you were saying the, the game has to be designed with that intent from yeah. from the get-go the minute yeah. you start doing that it's hard to sell because those don't make money right exactly. now. There's no, there's yeah. nothing that has made there's money, no money in it right now. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, fun times guys. Yeah. I will, <laughs> I will say there are, uh, what, uh, oh man, I had what I was looking forward to. Cause uh, like, really all I've been playing is EverQuest. I've been doing a lot of project form. Mm -hmm. um and leveling up there mm -hmm. it's been it's been loads of fun uh we went on a tangent dude. i know Jesus. we went we went on a tangent thanks to anthony that and where? he's bricked up again <laughs> oh man wow oh, man. Um, <laughs> what i am what i'm looking forward to there were there were a few i'm looking forward to i mean some of them aren't coming out for a while i think there was um Oh, you know what? Uh, what I'm looking forward to most in the short term, because there's things like mm. Stalker 2 that I'll talk about when we get closer to it, but they extended the release. They pushed back the release date, so that's not coming out this year now. But Got you. Um, I am looking forward to, so my favorite horror director right now, Mike Flanagan, uh, uh -huh. is doing The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe, and that's getting released for October. Oh, Netflix. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am so excited. I love all of Michael Flanagan's stuff. He's probably... Isn't he... Isn't he, uh, the, he did the ha um, the Haunting of Hill House. Amityville Horror. Amityville Horror. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, The Haunting ahead. of Hill House. The Haunting oh, of Bly, Bly Manor. Nice. Yeah, yeah he yeah. did uh, um, Midnight Mass. Yeah, I was about to say, I was like, I can't find the words. I know what I'm trying to say, but yeah. I can't. But um, my ADHD brain. <laughs> but yeah, he all of the stuff that he's done recently has been really, really phenomenal. I'm kind of sad that they didn't give the Midnight Club another season to develop. The first season, Eric, that that series was that series was bad. It I'm wasn't you, bad. It, 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 Eric, it had so Eric, much that was going for it. I feel Eric, it just didn't have time to breathe yet. Eric. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you right now, that thing was a dead fish. Yeah. <laughs> there was not, there was not enough, uh, there was not enough to the actual 
story of the series for you to be feel bonded to it like midnight mass did oh i mean yeah okay okay comparatively to the haunting of hill house and midnight mass but here's the thing the midnight club was supposed to be a three season arc that had that built up here they they, they should have came at it like stranger things and should have had mini arcs that actually had punch like agreed Agreed. grit to it there was not enough in those little short stories that they did for every single one agreed yeah, this is a series I want to go ahead and watch. But there were so many nice connections. There were so many nice foreshadowings. There was so much information that was hidden in the background, like normal. Eric, it was, ex- Eric, it was expensive. It was- Are you afraid of a dark of the dark? Shut up. It, w- it was. It was. It was. But I like Are You Afraid of the Dark? You know, what, I, what are we hey, talking look, about? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gonna badmouth the Are You Afraid of the Dark, but it is from the 90s. Agreed. And this series is is in current Agreed. day. Agreed. You have to you're gonna have to fight for my attention better than that. However, with all that mid- said. It, it was mid. It was, mid. but it with all that fun. said, Michael Flanagan doing the all the House of Usher, which is one of Edgar Allan Poe's classic uh, stories. Worth, worth. Hopefully, he I'm excited for it. to the occasion. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm I'm excited for that. So that that's kind of what I'm looking forward to this month. That's kind of fantastic. Me. And then I'm gonna, of course, keep my eye out for some scary games. Scary games are always my favorite. Oh, Ooh, it's October. So it's like October, man. Pretty hot. I, yeah. I know. I'm hoping we get a, a good one. Um, I, I haven't really kept up with any of the ones that are supposed to come out. So I fucking hate scary games, y'all. I love scary <laughs> games. Too. They're the best. You will Me get to Anthony live through them vicariously Jesus. as I play them. No. <laughs> uh, I'm okay without it. <laughs> I mean, I like you guys already saw how I reacted to scary games when we did that, like the marathon and then yeah. also the uh the scary games until like f- what three in the morning i just can't believe that you and i both didn't want to be doing that yet eric <laughs> i just i think eric just had the persuasive power what, yeah. what can we say I I, we were young I and, and I, he did he know. put something in that coffee that we brewed <laughs> probably, probably i just i just want to point it out put it out there and this is kind of for me anthony and that so the first time we we went and met Nat in person. Nat, that was seven years ago. Jesus. And my elbow was still broken from that. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Seven years. Wow. Seven years ago. Good times, y'all. Good times. Good times. Good times. Well, uh, yeah. And we didn't even have a sponsor spot, guys. Would we didn't. We didn't. We didn't. Spot? So, um, play VR. Real talk. We're just coming, coming closer. Come, in. Come here, real close. Yeah. I just real close. Flavia, if you're out there, if you're listening, <laughs> sponsor us, please. Okay, thank you. Bye. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't talk to you like I talked to you. Come in close for me, Flavia. Just real quick, real quick. You know that I'm gonna take care of you, so I need you to go ahead and take care of me. You know what I'm saying? I need you to get real nice with me <laughs> we need, I need it. that sponsor we I need, need that it. sponsorship baby we need it. Mm. Um, <laughs> but yes that's our that's our quick ad break well i guess with that said we'll see you on the next one right yeah. we'll see you in the next Autonomous one Autonomous neural trained holistic organic network yeet says bye <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh. nice We'll see you in the next one, guys. Have a good day. Bye. Peace.